we have great fortune today um, to have Dr. Kayum speaking with us. So um, I think this is a meaningful talk in, especially in terms of education in our department for trainees and for those, um, those of us on faculty supervising and working with trainees around discussion of patient suicide. So um, I'll go ahead and introduce Dr. Kayum and then hand it over to her. So um, yeah, so Dr. Zayla Kayum is the training director for the Child and Adolescent Psychiatry Fellowship Program and the medical director of the Emergency Psychiatry Services at Boston Children's Hospital. She holds faculty appointments at Yale School of Medicine and Harvard Medical School. She is also the associate training director for the Boston Children's Hospital Tufts Triple Board Program. <clears throat> She trained in child and adolescent psychiatry in consultation liaison psychiatry and subsequently completed a master's in medical education at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Kayum has published on the topics of medical education, the impact of patient su suicide on psychiatrists, autism spectrum disorders, inpatient treatment of early psychosis, and risk of youth suicide and firearms. She has a particular interest in the areas of supervision and mentorship, psycho-oncology, and palliative care. And she also serves as a Lieutenant Colonel in the United States Army Reserves Medical Corps and deployed to Afghanistan and later was mobilized in support of COVID, the COVID-19 response in New York. And with that, thank you so much, Dr. Kayum, for joining us. I will hand it over to you now. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much and a good afternoon and thank you for having me uh, again. <laughs> um, uh, I'll try and share my screen. So if you could just let me know, you can see it. Yes, Perfect. That Thank good. you so much. So um, I'm going to be talking about uh, how we support trainees uh, in the event of patient suicide. And although I'll be talking about psychiatry trainees, I think this is more generalizable to a lot of our support staff, our other uh, associated clinicians who are involved in the care of the patient and all of our medical staff. I don't have any financial disclosures. And I'm hopeful that we'd be able to sort of have an idea about what the experience, not just of trainees is like, but what are we supposed to do as supervisors? And then what are the factors that influence how we experience this and how we can best support our trainees um, in such an event? So since I graduated uh, and started working, I've been pretty much in acute psychiatry. And I've had a few patients who died by suicide by this time. And they've ranged from a 13 year old that died several months after I discharged them from the inpatient unit to a young woman who, uh, completed suicide six weeks after discharge on the last day of completing a partial hospitalization program. There was a young woman I took care of since she was 15 and by the time she was 20 and she had multiple inpatient hospitalizations. And finally, by the time she was 20, she uh, died by suicide in the attempt that was completed. And then one of the recent ones was 16 year old that I had discharged after a fairly routine inpatient hospitalization for eight days. I discharged this kid on a Thursday to their therapy appointment. They had a partial intake on Friday, and then something happened over social media over the weekend. So on Monday, when I was walking to work, I get a call from the social worker saying, hey, you remember that kid you discharged on Thursday? They hang themselves over the weekend. And so not only was I reeling from my own experience as I was walking into work, I was reminded of the fact that I had a PGY-1 with me on this case. And it was their first week on psychiatry after being on medicine for four weeks, four months. And this was the first patient that they discharged. And I had a discussion with this uh, intern who sat in my office and I was fairly 
clueless about how do you approach such a situation when I was feeling fairly overwhelmed myself and how much do you let them speak or how much do you prompt them if they don't want to talk about what they're experiencing in that moment? How much do I share? How much confusion do I show? And so I think what I walked away from uh, that experience with was just this sense that not only was it all a fog and um, I had this overwhelming feeling that I had failed my patient, but also that I'd let my trainee down. And so as we uh, do um, in medicine is when you don't know something, you look it up. And so I found that the APA website has this section on helping residents cope with the patient's suicide. And it talks about common emotional reactions like you know, sadness or guilt and how to cope, talks about you know, approach a supervisor or write about this or read about this. And questions for supervisors are just questions with no answers. It, it's like, what would happen if I call the family? Oh, do I pretend I'm okay? Um, if I talk about this, will it increase my risk of being sued? And useful references really are geared towards more robust risk assessments but there's really not much out about what do you do afterwards? What I found actually that was helpful was this after a suicide toolkit uh, by the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention that actually is geared towards what do training programs do in the event of a trainee dying by suicide? But I found it to be more helpful because it says in the immediate aftermath of finding out, get everybody together, get the correct information, Make sure you're not divulging more than you're supposed to, but be transparent, be supportive. This is what you do in one week. This is how you track and touch base in a month or so. So I thought that was actually a more helpful framework to think about. But what we do know is that suicide is a leading cause, second leading cause of death in adolescents and young adults. The rates are increasing and it may be up to like if we're looking even beyond 15 years, that it's um, more than 24%, but about a third to two thirds of general psychiatry residents experience patient suicide during their training. And it not only affects our trainees, but our social workers, our nursing staff, our mental health professionals, both at the personal and professional level. And when we're thinking about our other staff, um, I thought this study was helpful out of Switzerland that was looking at about 275 participants, 65% of which were women, but they were also looking at nurses and psychologists and other support staff. And they found that at least a quarter of them by this time in their careers had ha experienced more than five suicides of patients that they've taken care of. So this is a reality in our practice, particularly for those of us who are in acute care. And not only has it an effect on professional practice, but it really impacts our own personal reactions. And a lot of people had a lot more anxiety working with high risk patients, especially in that first month after a patient dying by suicide. And that this emotional uh, reaction does decrease in intensity over time in our thoughts and preoccupations about it. And that there tends to be a bit of a traumatic response um, uh, in the immediate aftermath, uh, where it's talking about cognitive uh, changes in terms of intrusive thoughts, or some people experience uh, nightmares or um, increased hypervigilance in their work. And then changes in practice uh, was found to be more uh, in social workers than nurses, but also younger professionals than the more senior professionals. and. Uh, female professionals reported greater impact on their uh, personal and professional reactions. So what we did was, well, um, we went to study this in um, interviewing trainees to see what their experience was like, and then also supervisors and see how prepared and comfortable were they in providing this kind of supervision to their trainees and if there was a gap between what the trainees wanted out of supervision 
and see if we could come up with some supervision guidelines based on that. And so this was a qualitative study where we did semi-structured interviews, and then we used inductive thematic analysis to help frame our results through an iterative process. And what was interesting about the trainees was that we had about 13 trainees and all of those were current trainees. And two of them had two patients die by suicide at that time and one of them had had three, uh, including one in medical school. And then as would be expected, the PGY2 and PGY3 years are where most of these occur, which tend to be heavy inpatient and outpatient longitudinal experiences for most psychiatry trainees. And then in terms of supervisors, they varied in terms of their experience, but 12 out of 14 of them had had to supervise a trainee on a patient they themselves uh, were taking care of. So we call that shared loss. And in terms of our results, we found that the suicide of a patient was a central life-changing event in the professional lives of trainees and supervisors that had a lot of emotional impact. And this central experience was really impacted by this general sense of unpreparedness at multiple levels, whether it was a trainee or much more uh, on a systems level. And then there were things that happened afterwards that uh, really influenced how the whole experience uh, was viewed by the trainee. And we'll talk a little about all of these. So everybody, whether they were a trainee or a supervisor, said that this really impacted them significantly and was a very serious event in their lives. And it had significant emotional impact. Initially, there was this feeling of you know, this shock and devastation and this suddenness that left them stunned. And this was then followed by a sense of sadness for the patient and their family. But then trainees said that after something like this happened, they felt very different from their peers who had not experienced the uh, death of a patient by suicide, that this had happened to them, not to the other members of their class or their residency training program. Um, and it led to a lot of feelings of shame and guilt as a result. They also uh, experienced a lot of changes in their self-efficacy. Like this was a really big blow to their confidence and their sense of competence. And this was not only unique to trainees, even attending psychiatrists, particularly those that were early career reported that this was very true for them. And then afterwards, it was a lot of anxiety and tentativeness uh, around clinical decision-making and documentation that people were paying a lot more attention to how they were documenting risk assessments and you know, asking those questions and making sure they get all the detail information um, to, just because they were feeling so much anxiety around working with high-risk patients afterwards. And then the sense of responsibility that somehow they had failed in their professional duty and obligation to this patient that had somehow resulted in this patient's death, or that somehow it was something that they did or didn't do that resulted in this outcome. Like this trainee said, what happened? How did this happen? What did I miss? What have I done? Am I really cut out for this? Should I be a psychiatrist? Should I go to this fellowship? Should I come back to work tomorrow? A lot of self-doubts and a lot of guilt and worry. And so whether it was supervisors or trainees, everyone was having a deeply emotional reaction, but they all reported a sense of unpreparedness at different levels. Like the trainees said that they felt that they weren't prepared for this, even though someone might have mentioned it to them in passing, and they felt that it was really important for them to be inoculated by this sense of like, you know, as a trainee, whether it happens to you during your training years or it happens to you when you're in practice, this is a reality of, uh, of our field. And that it should be a standard part of their training. This should not be something that we discuss in response to an event, but before. And that it would be very helpful for trainees to be introduced 
and have discussions with supervisors who have had this experience with patient suicide so that they would know who are those people within their training program that they uh, can reach out to or turn to if they have such experience. Like this trainee described, I was not taught what to do if something like this happened. I don't know, at least I don't remember being told like, hey residents, if at any point one of your patient unfortunately dies by suicide or something, do these steps. Write an email to this person. Let's set up an appointment or meeting. Let's meet in two months from now to see how you're doing. I don't remember that. And the supervisors also said that they felt unprepared because they had no formal training on how to manage the aftermath of a patient suicide, um, even from an administrative perspective, like what are the department or the hospital policies around this and what does risk management require them to do? And they also were very unanimous, so I felt like I wasn't alone in this, that they had no instruction on how to supervisor train such an event. So what supervisors ended up doing was if they'd had this experience before in their training years or their early careers, they would use that experience to inform supervision. But they all felt that they needed more anticipatory guidance so that they could better support the trainees, both from an emotional perspective but also how to navigate the numerous um, analytical and administrative tasks that, uh, that they're sort of um, posed with after such an event. And I think this supervisor highlighted, what is normal? What would be a grief reaction? How can we talk to the family and be conciliatory? What is the language that you might use? If you're at such a loss for words, what are the words that someone might say? Should you, could you, would you want to go to the service? Who can a fellow or resident talk to about this? What are the resources available for those individuals? A clear understanding of responsibility and how the institution reviews responsibility or the state. I had none of that. And 10 years out, I'm not sure how much of that I know now. And so in addition to the trainees and the supervisors, the trainees also felt that they, from a programmatic perspective, weren't aware of what were the policies about something like this, or what were the, the steps or algorithms from the program about any directive about what were the steps that they were supposed to take if something like this happened to one of their patients. And that they weren't also aware of any programmatic support that was available to them beforehand. A lot of times programs provided supports after something like this happened, but the trainees weren't sure what they could ask for. And there were a few trainees who said, yes, they were some policies at their institution, but they got it in all of their orientation material when they started, and it was just gathering dust with all the other uh, things that they got at the start of their training. So even if such policies existed, they weren't regularly revisited or implemented or disseminated or brought to people's attentions um, at regular intervals. And everyone was unanimous that the notification process was inconsistent, that ideally it should be the program uh, director team or a primary supervisor who reaches out to the trainee and lets them know that this happened to their patient. But what ends up happening is that patient is involved in a system where there might be multiple touch points. And so it could be anyone who finds out and then lets the trainee know uh, or how this comes to them. For example, it could be a mass email that comes from risk management uh, that says, you know, this patient has died by suicide. Or sometimes trainees are putting in a note or completing a discharge summary and you go to an electronic medical record and you get this banner that says you're entering the chart of a deceased patient. Sometimes it's like a text that I got from one of the clinicians uh, involved in the patient's care, or it could be a, another staff member walking into ground saying that, you know, that patient we discharged some time ago has died by suicide. There were instances in which some of these suicides were very public and on social media or the news that people found out. Um, there was an instance where one of the trainees described that 
uh, someone just left an obituary in their mailbox and they were just standing there not knowing what to do. And the reason that the notification process was brought up is that everyone was in agreement that um, in person or on the phone support uh, is important so that the trainee knows what to do. And when they find out from all these other means, they're often left by themselves um, without any clear directive or guidance or support at that moment. Like this supervisor said, we should have a templated scenario for when this happens. What is the chain of events? Who needs to know? What's the response going to be? What's your policy going to be in terms of leave and time? What's your approach going to be in terms of assuring people to talk to someone professionally? Also, what departmental training or community response are you going to have? How does that happen? Who's going to do that? These should be things that people have at least talked about, if not formalized, what to enact at that time. And then as a system in general, we seldom discuss suicide as a regular part of our institutional culture. We tend to do it afterwards or in response to an event. And then trainees highlighted that when they're on medicine and they're taking care of terminal patients or they're on hemong or they're in the ICU or taking care of patients who have hospice care, there is this conceptualization of like this patient is terminal or this is terminal illness. But we don't really regularly conceptualize psychiatric illness as having um, is as being terminal illness, or having that kind of prognosis or outcome. And because of this, they experience the death of a patient on a medical floor very differently than they experience the death of a patient due to suicide. And then there's also this culture of stoicism or business as usual that we're taking care of very acute uh, patients in high volume settings. And um, there is this obligation of taking care of patients. And so trainees felt this sense of feeling torn and feeling conflicted and needing to take care of themselves and step, step away versus his obligation of the patients that are waiting for them to take care of. And so they felt very sort of torn between taking care of themselves or, their pay, or asking for support. And then some trainees and supervisors highlighted that the formal review processes, whether they're M&Ms or they're peer reviews, which are really um, administrative meetings, they tend to be very formal and very analytical. They're looking at what were the steps taken that led to this outcome. Whereas the people who are actually sitting in that meeting are having a very deeply emotional experience. And sometimes the clinical team may not be aligned in all of the decisions that were made. And at times that could lead to tensions or disagreements or blaming. And so they felt that at times these formal review reviews were unsupported. And so this trainee said that, you know, then we just went and saw another patient. The day was supposed to continue in a way that had been unaffected. I think that there was some discussion about it in the multidisciplinary team rounds the day after, but it seemed that life went on and there wasn't much processing of the experience as a whole for anyone, especially for the trainees that had been involved. And so on one end, it was this general sense that people weren't prepared for this beforehand. And then there were factors that really mediated or complicated the whole experience. For example, all trainees were very unanimous about um, the if, sort of the effect of the relationship and the supervisory relationship that they had already built with their primary supervisor. And so if this was a positive and supportive relationship with their supervisor, they just felt it was easier to access them. And on many times, the person that they spoke to or discussed this with was the primary attending on the team uh, or for that case. Um, but what the trainees felt was that it was really helpful for them to see that someone that they admired and respected and thought was a great clinician but have something like this happen to them and they were able to navigate that and they were still great clinicians um, and it was really helpful for them to hear from someone like that. So they were very clear that 
they wanted to hear from a supervisor who'd actually had this experience rather than reassurances and support uh, from a supervisor who hadn't. Not that that was not welcome, but it was just helpful to hear from someone who, who know, knew what it was like. And I think this supervisor said that well. I think that it's a lot easier. You have a lot more credibility in supervising residents when you've been through it. I think that if you haven't and you're trying to help them feel less shame about it, no matter how good of a job you do, it's still this idea for them of like, well, yes, but this hasn't happened to you. It happened to me. I think there's a credibility aspect. And then just knowing what helps most for me, I think informs supervision as well. And then this was highlighted by many faculty and trainees that there is this tension between this expectation that we can prevent all suicide. And realistically in clinical practice, what is our ability to really do so and how well can we predict and prevent um, suicide in our clinical practice? And that this per perception that all suicide is preventable um, and so when the bar is set at, you know, zero suicide or all suicide is preventable, then anytime you don't meet that standard, it feels like a failure. And I know this is a bit long, but I think this really captures it. I think as a culture, we buy into the notion that we're not supposed to let anybody die and it's our fault that they do. And then we'll get sued. The notion of culpability is very much built into the idea that we have to look okay, make sure my documentation is good, that I ask those right questions. And if I did all that, I won't get sued and I'm okay. That's not sufficient. I think it hurts our capacity to care for people in these situations and undermines our supervisory relationships. We have to grow beyond the notion that we did something bad when we couldn't prevent it. Death is part of what we do when we treat people. And then there are also patient characteristics. We're taking care of high-risk patients in you know, high acuity settings. And sometimes despite our best intentions and uh, whatever we put in place, sometimes those things don't pan out or people fall through the cracks. Um, and then a lot of the trainees felt like the young age of a patient was particularly difficult, especially for adolescents, because not only were they thinking of you know, the life unlived or all the potential unmet, but also that somehow mental health treatment had failed someone so early on. And the younger age of the patient also made it difficult for the trainees in particular, if they felt greater identification with the patient or it reminded themselves of someone in their lives. And then something also, another thing that came up was that Sometimes there were cultural barriers or minority status of the patient that conferred additional risk that they may not have fully appreciated in that moment, but in hindsight, they could see, oh yes, depression in this particular culture may not have appeared as they would have expected it, or it was the minority status of the patient that added more risk than um, that they thought, or, or how much minority stress uh, sort of factored in. And then at times, uh, there was the violence of the suicide itself. Sometimes uh, there was a, a couple of instances uh, in our participants where the suicide occurred on the inpatient unit or in the parking lot of the hospital. Um, there were a couple of instances where it was very public and on social media and someone had put that up before they died. And so all of that really contributed to a lot of additional stress uh, for the trainee and the team. And then just like the, the family who doesn't get complete closure uh, in the event of a patient suicide, it is fairly similar for the clinical team. And then there were times where the clinical team felt like talking to the patient's family was very helpful. And they got some responses where it was a thank you. You know, we knew how, how, how much they were struggling and you gave us additional time or thank you for taking care of them for all this time. And then there were other instances where the family was distraught and very angry. And a lot of that became directed towards the, the clinical team. Like this, like for this particular trainee, I wasn't sure what to do. 
Then I received a voicemail from the wife, a very angry voicemail actually saying, I just want you to know that my husband killed himself. She confirmed that he hung himself and she said, I asked for help. I begged people for help. Nobody helped me. Very, very angry voicemail message. We sent her a condolence card. I talked to my supervisor about whether or not I should call, and she thought that would be a bad idea. I spoke to risk management and they said, no, don't call. You can send a note, but don't call. She's too angry right now. And then there was this area I wanted to explore with shared loss, where the supervisors also felt deeply affected by the patient's suicide, and this was true for all the supervisors that we spoke with. And they felt that they needed to take a moment to, for themselves to grieve or put themselves together before they felt that they were available to supervise their trainee. And they also acknowledged that there was this fine balance that they needed to maintain to be authentic and be human um, and let them know that they were impacted by this, but also not overwhelm the trainees with how, how they were feeling. And that uh, supervisor said that was actually very difficult and challenging to manage your own emotions that were in many aspects very similar to the trainees, a sense of guilt and shame and loss and sadness and anger. Um, but what was different was that as a supervisor, you ultimately shoulder the responsibility for all the decisions that were made. And that was kind of where the ultimate responsibility fell. And so some supervisors said that in these initial stages, as much as they wish um, they were more available for the, the, their trainees, they might not have been in the best place to provide the kind of supervision that they wish that they could have based on their own standards. Like the supervisor said, when I was a junior attending and all the and, and these two patients died, I believe that I was not in a good position to be helpful to residents. I hope and I imagine that I conduct myself adequately and appropriately, but I think at the time, because of my youth and inexperience, I was so involved in what the deaths meant to me that I was less genuinely accessible to the residents than I might have been. And the trainees were aware of this and that impacted their supervisory relationship. So if they felt like the, the supervisor was um, really struggling or um, that there was a lot of like flatness or dismissiveness or undue stoicism um, or overt sadness, that this was the, the supervisor's way of dealing with it. But if they felt that it was dismissive, dismissive or they felt unsupportive, it did com complicate their relationship with the supervisor, their ability to reach out to the supervisor for support. Like one of the trainees said that um, it was actually the neurology attending during their neurology rotation who said, hey, you know, while they were walking down the hall, that patient that we saw last week, uh, they just blew their brains out and then walked away. And so the trainee was left by themselves trying to figure out what to do and who to talk to. And then they reached out to their own program to find additional support and, and supervision. Some of the trainees felt like this parallel process of grieving with the supervisor was actually quite helpful, that they didn't have to do it in isolation. And it diminished that sense of like they had to deal with it by themselves. But others felt like if their supervisor was struggling, that they instead needed to comfort their supervisor rather than ask for support for themselves. And in these instances, what they found was more helpful was to actually reach out to another supervisor who had had this experience but was removed from the case. So what we learned from all of this was that we're all very clear of what should actually happen, but the reality of how it pans out and unfolds can be very different. And this was different for people who had experienced more than one uh, patient dying by suicide, that each of those instances ended up being different and how it was handled and how it actually impacted and the level of support they got for each of those within the institution or between different institutions. But what everybody said was that the response to a patient's suicide 
tends to be very reactive rather than a proactive one in preparing people for it and what to do and what to expect and who to reach out to. And that there is this disconnect that when something like this happens, the people involved in the care of a patient are having an emotionally, a very deeply emotional experience but for better or worse, the administrative meetings tend to be very analytical and removed. So what would be helpful is that, it, yes, maybe the administrative processes and those meetings should not be a place where the emotional impact is discussed, but maybe there needs to be designated time and space uh, delineated for that before the administrative uh, meetings happen so that people have had a time an opportunity to process that before they step into these administrative meetings. And something our study supported uh, was the previous findings in literature that it's really the trainee and supervisor's re relationship that is key to how trainees experience this because it allows them to process this in a safe space that is created by the supervisor. And that Previous literature says, you know, the impact is greater on trainees than for clinicians in practice. But what we found was that the emotional process is actually fairly similar, maybe not the intensity of it for trainees and supervisors, but particularly for supervisors who are early career and had not experienced this in their training years, they had a particularly difficult time that was fairly similar to what the trainees described. What was different was that as early career psychiatrists, they obviously were uh, responsible for patient decisions. And something everyone was very clear about is that this is a loss that has to be owned as a whole by everyone and not alone, which is really important. Like this supervisor highlighted, I could have imagined many settings when it didn't go this way, but the fact that everybody was saying, Yes, we're owning this as a system, and we're going to call the family together. That has to happen. It has to be the hospital taking responsibility because ultimately the reasons we can and can't admit people and the length of stay that we have and all of that is not just because of one person in an office. It's everything that the system sets up. I think that having that kind of system-wide response is absolutely critical. And then sort of switching gears from how this experience uh, unfolds and uh, what we're supposed to do, what do we do in supervision? Um, and what we found from the supervisors was that, and also from the trainees, that this validation of yes, this has happened, and yes, you're supposed to feel this way. It's normal to have feelings of sort of shame and guilt and the self-doubt that comes in the immediate aftermath. Yes, it happens. It's normal, sort of validating that and normalizing it is key. And then in terms of processing, the most important thing that we can do as supervisors is really create the space. People may not be ready to talk about it in that moment, or they may need to have that space immediately. But at least if we create that space and the training can then use it based on however they want to process that experience, whether they want to do it now, or they know that space exists and they could use it as a future. Because again, people will be bringing in their own uh, experiences in life of how this would impact them. We don't always know what our learners and trainees have experienced or are bringing in with them in terms of their life lived experience. And then also people process things and grieve at different rates and in different ways. So it may not be something that they need at the moment, but knowing that that's a place for them that they can return to when they need it uh, is probably the most important aspect. And then the trainees felt that the most important component of supervision that they felt was helpful to them was thoughtful disclosure of the supervisor's own experience of how they had actually dealt with a patient dying by suicide, how they processed it, what it was like, what to expect, it was probably the most helpful aspect of that supervision. So they knew that there was their sort of scaffolding in which, with, uh, in which they could then sort of process their own experience, 
but also it diminished that sense of isolation that has only happened to them and the way that they're feeling to them. Some trainees felt that reviewing the case with an attending was actually helpful so they could go over it. What supervisors felt that they needed to do and be more cognizant of was to make sure that when there's self-doubt or tentativeness or hesitation around clinical decision-making, that they're to support that for the trainee and help restore that sense of confidence and competence in their abilities as much as possible and sort of being very aware of that in their supervision meetings. And then also giving people explicit permission to grieve and mourn this loss because it is a loss like any other. For many people, this occurred on an inpatient unit. For others, it was a longitudinal relationship with the patient. But also people who had discharged people straight from the emergency room and had not had a long-standing relationship with the patient, they also felt very devastated from this experience and also had a significant feeling of loss. Um, and so making sure that we're letting people know um, that experiencing grief is a normal, normal process and part uh, of this experience. And then reminding our trainees and everyone involved to be kind to themselves and take care of themselves and be compassionate. And without blame or, or um, sort of guilt, uh, what are we going to learn from this experience? Um, and reflecting on that of what is it that it means to you in your personal and professional life and what are you going to carry forward with you um, um, in the future? And I think in terms of supervision, this supervisor said it well, that part of it is because I've had my own experience with a completed suicide. I will often describe the course of my own trajectory, but in a way that allows them to either resonate with it or not. I think the part that I remind them of is that it's an intense feeling that does go away. It is something that should be shared with the right people and that there needs to be appropriate attention paid to it and that it's not quick. It's a much slower process. And then in terms of uh, program leadership, it's incumbent on us to make sure that we're preparing our trainees ahead of time before something like this happens and let them know what are the supports available to them? And also preparing the faculty both for an administrative and supervisory perspective. And then also streamlining the notification as much as possible with having clear policy and postvention protocols about who's going to let the trainee know, where do the chief residents fall in? Do you do a case conference? Do you have individual meetings with supervisors? Do you set them up? Do you have the trainee set them up? When do you check in with other trainees um, so that it's a good learning experience for everyone? And then also within our busy days, making sure that we're taking a moment to pause and acknowledge like something happened. And even if we can't sort of uh, create time to debrief in that moment, at least taking a moment to set aside time so people know when they can get together to process this and debrief or talk about it, or whether they wanna do it in a group or they wanna do it individually. However, um, there is appropriate attention paid to it within a, a busy work day. And then accommodations and workload. There were trainees who said, you know, I, I, don't want, I didn't wanna take any time off. I wanted to be busy. I didn't wanna think about it. I just wanted to get through the rest of my week. And then there were other trainees who just said, it was really great when an attending said, let's go for coffee or, hey, you know, all the things that you have scheduled for the afternoon are being canceled, take some time, uh, go take a break. Uh, we'll see you, you know, in a day or two. Um, and then chief residents who stepped in and said, we noticed you were on call this weekend, we've already switched it. And so trainees felt like, you know, if these accommodations were proactively offered to them, they could take it or leave it based on whatever they were feeling comfortable about, but at least the onus of having to ask for those accommodations was taken away from them and that felt much more comfortable to them. 
And then periodic check-ins. A lot of times trainees go off service or they rotate and it's important that people reach out to them and let them know about uh, something like this happening and then letting them know what the supports are available to them. There was one instance uh, for one of these patients where the resident had already rotated off service and I called them to let them know um, and in that moment, you know, we had a conversation. They were like, you know, I'm fine. And I said, well, you know, should you change your mind? The offer for coffee is open. And it was about three weeks later that they called and said, you know, Dr. Hu, can I take you up on that offer if it still exists? Um, so again, people will process this um, at different times. And then identifying support both within the program and outside the program or the people within your institution, people can talk to you. Do you actually have clinician support or other things available? Do you have people identified who provide psychotherapy for trainees outside? And then also peer support to diminish that sense of isolation. So they know for the people within their program, they can talk to you. And so there were certain limitations of this study. Obviously this was done in New England. Um, and a lot of the people who participated are the ones obviously who wanted to participate. We did not have anyone reach out to us who was involved in an active lawsuit. Um, but again, there was a self-selection and I always wonder like if these were complicated or there was some uh, issues of malpractice involved, would people be experiencing this differently? We did reach saturation early on, so we're fairly comfortable with our um, sample size. But again, I do wonder about people who chose not to participate if they had found the diff different or difficult experiences. And then I'll end this here um, with this quote, because I think it encapsulates it well. This will take a place in your life and it'll have purpose, it'll have meaning, and it'll feel a little, you'll never forget it. And it'll only strengthen you in the end if you let yourself think about it enough and feel enough about it, you'll be a better psychiatrist. That's how you do honor to the person who killed themselves. And I just wanted to thank all the people who were involved in this study, but more so the people who participated in this research study and shared their stories and experiences very courageously with her, with, with us, and then also our patients that teach us so much. And I'm happy to share more references and please feel free to reach out. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Kayum. Really appreciate this very meaningful presentation. Um, I wanted to pause and open it for questions if people would like to unmute or we'll follow the chat. Yeah, um, I, I have a question. Sure, please go, Dr. Yeah, th thank you very much. This was a wonderful presentation. Um, and uh, I wanted to ask something uh, more or less specific in terms of recommendations. And, and, and this pertains to, for you to elaborate some more and what you recommend in terms of meeting, offering a, the, for the resident to offer to meet the family. Yeah. Soon after they hear about the suicide reaching out to the family and offering to meet the family in person. And also when it seems appropriate to attend funeral services. And um, so I, I was hoping that you can comment on that. Thank you. So from what I heard from the people who participated, um, there were two things. One was that comes up frequently whenever something like this happens. <clears throat> is risk management calls and says, you can't talk about this to anybody. Um, so I think the first thing to do is really check with risk management of your institution, because many times uh, they have their own procedures and policies, but really it doesn't take away from the fact that the family sometimes is asking to speak to, to the clinical team and then also, many times our relationships with the patient and the family is what actually mitigates lawsuits because you've reached out to them and you've provided support and you've heard them. So in terms of providing this for trainees, what I heard from trainees was that they would want to be given the option 
and then they can see whether they're ready for it or not, and that they would always appreciate doing this with attending support. So if the, uh, the team is there and the faculty is there, they feel much more comfortable in being part of it. There were a couple of trainees who did highlight that they were put in this position without attending support. And that was very difficult for them. So I think as long as people have support, this is a difficult conversation to have. And then also limits of confidentiality where you can actually talk to the family and hear what they have to say. I think those are things that with faculty, people can navigate much better. And in the same vein, another thing that was brought up was when they're presenting at M&Ms, for example, that a lot of times trainees felt like I can present versus I wish I didn't have to present or maybe someone else could be designated was removed from the case to present. But either way, I think providing trainees with an option is helpful. Yeah, and I, I, I just want I want to comment. The, the the issue of the legal involvement is of course very complicated, and I, I think that doesn't align necessarily well with what's best for the for the resident uh, or the clinician. Uh, my view, and you know, the couple times that this has happened to me, uh, I have reached out to the family before hearing from legal or anything. And, and offer to meet with them. Um, and I, I think like like you've said, I mean, that may help to decrease the, the temperature on the family side in terms of having questions about legal um, uh, follow-up. Um, if the family, my sense is that if the family already is making threats about legal issues, then I would recommend to the resident not necessarily offer to maybe talk to them on the phone, but not not to meet necessarily. And in terms of going I, I, going to a service, a funeral service, okay. my my uh, experience has been that uh, on patients that I've known uh, or the patient that I knew for a long term and was my patient um, and committed suicide, I asked the family if it was okay for me to attend the service, and they said it was. But thank exactly, you. I think taking the family's lead where funeral services are important. I just make one clarification because I know there is a, a, a question that where the legal portion is sort of there, it does not preclude trainees seeking help and support for how they feel without disclosing or discussing the details of the case. And so that even if risk management says you can't speak to anybody, you can feel you can talk about how you're feeling or what you're experiencing or how to get support to get through that. I know there's another question. Sorry. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Nika Gosian. I see you have your hand up. Hi, thank you so much for the great presentation. Um, I'm so glad you kind of touched a bit on trying to prevent all suicides, and I think. I, luckily, I don't think that's here, but there has been hospital systems that I've been a part of where the zero suicide initiative was policy within the hospitals. And it would be almost like a witch hunt, whether it was a resident team, private attending or whatnot. And they there's this belief that every suicide could have been saved. And I do believe a lot of that's based on bad data or interpretation of bad data. And Dr. Boswick's work over at Mayo Clinic kind of exemplifies a lot of that. But it becomes hard to you know, advocate that we can't prevent every suicide when it's also kind of supported heavily by the NIMH as well. Um, and I was curious, what things would you recommend, whether it's advocacy or system level change to kind of maybe push back on the zero suicide initiative that is within hospital policy in a lot of places, maybe not at the top tier academic places, but there's training programs at very community level hospitals where these initiatives are commonplace. I absolutely agree. And I, I, I've i talked to a lot of people and every time I'm with a group of people, this is what comes up because policies don't always reflect the lived experiences of the people who have to fulfill those policies and live up to them and live by them. And so I absolutely agree that this is where we have data coming from from studies like this, the, the work at Mayo, which is showing that zero suicide or the interpretation and implementation of how literally it's taken 
um, is actually harmful rather than helpful. And definitely, if people want to take this up, I'll be happy to support that too, um, because um, it is, you know, in a time of physician burnout and difficulty in well-being and all those things, this is just another added layer of what complicates physician experiences and clinician experiences. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, and then it looks like Dr. Kreitschman, um, I'll hand it to you next. Thanks. Um, this is just a wonderfully kind and humane um, presentation um, and sort of uh, Following on what was just said, I think a lot of it is how we present things both to ourselves um, and to the public, because there's a lot of information, um, like has been said, that we're very poor at actually predicting suicide. Um, and that um, prevention, um, it's the same thing as saying that we're gonna have a national campaign to cure all cancers. It's a worthy goal, but it's not possible. And I think also, having more information about what we understand about suicide, that for most people, it's made in a moment. And that the decision um, and the intense intent for the majority of people is within an hour or so. This, the other part is, is that the greatest risk for people of suicide, as we know, and has been well documented, is within the month or two after discharge from the hospital. And that our system for aftercare, after psychiatric hospitalization is woefully inadequate. Um, and so I think that if the public and also our trainees understood the limits of what we can do and what we can predict, and our patients did too, um, and that a lot of the preventive medicine kinds of interventions that we can actually do is safety planning, and lethal means counseling, um, and that there are suicidality specific therapies, all those, uh, all that source of information can help us understand that we must be more modest in our expectations for ourselves and how we present ourselves to our patients. And I think your, your emphasis on how important it is for people who are experienced to acknowledge their own vulnerabilities and their own grief reactions. The last thing I wanted to say is, is that we also should recognize for the very few that oftentimes suicide is a source of traumatic grief and can result in complicated or prolonged grief disorder and that there are treatments specific for that. So one of the ways that we can be helpful to our trainees is being able to have them be able to self-identify if their grief process is overly traumatic and complicated and overly persistent, that there are specialized kinds of treatments besides supportive counseling. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, and then Dr. Grace, I'll hand to you next. Hi, thank you. I apologize, I don't have a camera, but I'm one of the child psychiatry fellows. Um, yeah, great points just made there. And then just wanted to mention, I really appreciated the use of that term, terminal psychiatric illness. I feel like that is a, a helpful contextualizing and, and expressive um, term that covers the medical reality of psychiatry. Uh, um, not to mention also helps address the the residual cultural dualism you know we have in our society that mental health is somehow different and or unrelated to physical health and is just a matter of willpower or effort um, but acknowledging that it truly is a severe and real and physical and mental condition that has morbidity and mortality so um, I think you know words are powerful and that's a helpful phrase I'm going to you know, use that when appropriate. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, everyone. All right. Well, we're at the turn of the hour. Um, we will definitely pass along the information that Dr. Kim has provided. And thank you again so much for your time today, Dr. Kim. We really appreciate thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me.
take care, everybody. Have a good weekend. Thank you.